Welcome to Forward with NACI, Inspiring Entrepreneurial Action, a podcast that shares the stories of everyday entrepreneurs, entrepreneurial leaders, and the communities that support us. We hope that this diverse collection of stories brings you inspiration, inspires you to take action, and ignites entrepreneurship in your community as we make our way forward together. Welcome to this episode of Forward with NACI, where we tell the stories of everyday entrepreneurs and leaders and people that are working to make the world a better place. I'm very happy to welcome Alex Bergman to the program. Alex, how are you doing this morning? I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me here. Well, I'm really glad that you're here, and I know you've got a, a lot of really good information in the story to tell. So why don't you begin um, with just sharing with our audience, um, who are you and what are some of the um, experiences in your life or decisions that got you um, to doing the work that you're doing today? Sure. So I'm a former teacher, and I moved to North Carolina in 2011 and taught third grade. And It was just very different than um, the school district I had come from. And so then I started substituting in Wake County schools um, to just learn more about the education system in North Carolina and the policies at the state level. And the biggest difference I saw was um, a difference with special education and kind of the mindset and policies regarding that. And so um, at the time, I also started helping my own son go through the special education process in second grade. And as I began to dig deeper in that process, and I learned a lot through social media and from other parents going through the same process and the difficulties. So that's when I was looking for a career change and didn't quite know what I wanted to do. And I figured out I could start um, advocating for families and helping them navigate the special education process using the procedures that I have been taught um, in my former school district. So that's really great, Alex, because it's a it's what we try to teach people or inspire people here at NACI is really um, look for a problem that you can solve and something that you're interested in and that you can be passionate about. And we had a, a great conversation the other day just preparing for um, this podcast, and it kind of inspired me. I looked on the um, the internet and I found a statistic that might surprise people that uh, 26% of adults in the United States have some type of disability. And they're broken um, you know, by category into you know, mobility, which I think is about 14%, cognition, which is you know, 11%, and, and on down the line. So I think what's interesting and what I learned from you the other day that I, I'd, I would love to get into a little bit more is that some disabilities are hidden. So if you think about, you know, one out of four people has a disability. If, you know, you have a, a vision disability, you can get some glasses on like what I have and they help you to see. Um, but one of the things I learned from you is really that some disabilities you can't see. And, and you mentioned Um, you know, some of those things. So before we jump into that, I want to um, maybe have you describe to everyone, you're a teacher, obviously, and a parent, what is an IEP um, in the special education world? Because some people may not know that. Yes, it's an individualized education plan. And so IDEA is the federal law that was began in 1975 to help these children be in the mainstream class and, you know, attend school with their peers. And it's evolved over the years. And that's where there is federal guidance about ADHD, um, you know, and dyslexia, you know, those are in the North Carolina state policies. They are recognized um, as a qualifying disability. That does not necessarily mean that you automatically get an IEP. There is a special education process that a child needs to go through. And once a referral is submitted by either the parents or the school that they suspect a disability, then the district has 90 days to go through evaluations, observations. Um, You know, there's a list of requirements for each eligibility area that needs to be conducted. 
um, and then the team would come back together for an eligibility meeting to determine if the child does indeed need an individualized education plan. And that's just a formal plan that lays out what goals the child would need to help address their weaknesses. And I think another thing that's really misunderstood a lot of times um, at the IEP table is that an IEP is not to help a child catch up with their peers or to perform like a typically developing student. That IEP document is to help a child with a disability prepare for future education, employment, and independent living. So it's really that kind of wraparound support that can so help really them achieve the goals. IEP, if I understand it, is really should be kind of co-created by a team. Um, the, the child's parent and guardian, the team um, at the school, and the whole idea, as I understand it, is really the best place for, um, for children is to be with their peers. They might have learning differences or challenges to some degree. And it sounds like, um, you know, on the advocacy end, you know, sometimes to get the best outcome, <laughs> you really have to be uh, not just sort of a passive person and show up, you've got to do these things. Um, but before we get into that, I, I want to um, understand a little bit more about um, ADHD and um, dyslexia. Maybe you could just explain it in, in layman's terms, because I wanted to share with you kind of what I've learned about some of uh, those disabilities is how my work in the entrepreneurship education world of what we try to do to turn um, maybe what could be looked at as challenges into, um, you know, assets. But I, I think just so we're, we know what we're talking about. So maybe start with ADHD and then um, talk with us about um, dyslexia and how that might manifest, even if it's on some type of a continuum. Absolutely. And <clears throat> that's my passion. Um, it's really helping kids, and especially the, there's a term called twice exceptional, which is a child that's gifted, but could also have the challenge of ADHD or dyslexia or, you know, something else going on that can kind of really mask that disability because they are so intelligent. And so, you know, people will think they're just being lazy or they're choosing not to do their homework. Um, and like you said, ADHD is a spectrum continuum, you know, it affects every child differently. You know, you can't say, oh, well, I taught one child with ADHD and then think every child coming into that classroom is going to be the same. Um, and that's where the evaluation process is, is so important. Um, you know, a lot of times school teams will jump to a 504 and think, and that's a also a federal plan that provides accommodations for a child, but it doesn't provide specially designed instruction. And so those accommodations can help support the child, but we all know. So what Alex would like, what ADHD, what does that look like? Is it a child that can't sit still? They can't pay attention. They're, you know, constantly kind of like running around doing things is what I think about as, as somebody that's not as, as knowledgeable about the topic as you are. Right. And I think that's usually, um, you know, kind of that go to thought, you know, and so sometimes when I'll bring up to school teams that we suspect this, um, ADHD in a child, they go to those kind of mainstream beliefs, you know, oh, well, they're not having trouble sitting still. They're not a behavior problem. You know, they're a really good compliant child. And so that's where it can look so differently. Um, you know, ADHD, we're learning so much more about it. And it's kind of like a light switch, you know, it can be impacting you severely at some moments and not at others. And so your daily stress, you know, um, if you're anxious about like an upcoming test, there's so many things that can kind of play into it, but it's really um, a difficulty with regulating your stresses. Oh, okay you know, emotional regulation, um, your processing speed can be affected. So, you know, I think in a traditional classroom, you think of, oh, those kids that raise their hand first, you know, they're the smart ones, when that's not necessarily the case, because a child with ADHD could be looking around and trying to navigate all of that sensory stimulation and, you know, trying to process what the answer is. 
And because it takes them longer, doesn't mean that they're slower. It's just that they had a little more difficulty coming up with the answer. And then by the time they raised their hand, they could already have a hundred negative beliefs about themselves. Oh, wow. That's, yeah, I, that's a really interesting way of, of understanding it and regulation. I honestly, I, I, I think that's almost a better descriptor of it because you also sometimes see people, I deal more with adults than children, but you do kind of see sometimes people just shut down and, and you're thinking in a meeting situation or in a training situation, they're not paying attention or they're, you know, and it kind of gives me something else to think about some empathy for that, because is it true that people do not outgrow ADHD? Is that like a lifelong thing that they just have to learn to live with? Or is it something that as they go into adulthood, they grow out of it? So I think the research tells us now we don't grow out of it, but we definitely learn coping skills and strategies and better how to manage it. And that was the big difference I noticed um, when moving to this area was a lot of the beliefs is just, you know, the child has to go and get medication and then they'll be fine. And so I'm a big proponent of pills do not teach skills. Oh, okay, good. You know, they absolutely medication can help manage things so that the child is able to learn, right? Because you can't learn if you're unregulated and, you know, completely. Well, and we we know too, you know, people have different learning styles, right? Um, I even think about myself, like high school, you know, back in my day, you had to sit in the chair and just watch somebody talk. And I just, when I got to college and I found out, you know, about this experiential learning and you could shift your schedule, it kind of, sort of open things things up. But I want to also get in because you had mentioned earlier about um, dyslexia and maybe people have a preconceived idea about what that is. So so maybe enlighten us in terms of what is what does that look like in, in terms of you know a child in the school system that is is trying to deal with that and a team that's trying to help that child. Yeah. And so dyslexia is a neurobiological difference. And so again it's not Um, defined by intelligence by any means. Um, It's difficulty learning those sounds and applying that. And so, especially working with super intelligent children who can like use context clues or use pictures and kind of guess, um, they're not learning that phonemic awareness and those phonics. And I'm really excited in our state, we've um, passed the um, legislation that all teachers will be trained in letters training, L-E-T-R-S, oh, okay. uh, which is the science of reading. And so moving around, away from um, the mi- mainstream way of teaching for the past you know, 10, 20 years was balanced literacy. Um, and so this is going more into a way that will um, help those children that do learn differently. And so with dyslexia, they need that explicit um, learning of all the different sounds and then how to decode the words. So not just memorizing them, but actually sounding them out. And then that will build their fluency. Um, So those are kind of some of the things. And that's where these children are intelligent enough and they don't want to appear like they don't understand what's going on. So they will develop a lot of um, coping skills that might ne- not necessarily be the best <clears throat> ones. And so they can kind of fly under the radar, but as they get into higher courses, um, you know, middle school, high school, where that vocabulary and the concepts become more difficult, it's going to be a lot harder. Um, so they'll kind of reach burnout and, you know, that's you where- lose potentially a child, um, you know, onto a a career or a life path, because we all know how difficult it is for every child um, to go through the middle school, high school. It's just hard. You know, you're growing up and everything is changing. And that's really interesting that you, you know, the way that you described it, um, you know, and I think hopefully people who are listening can really develop a lot of empathy. Because I know as a, just as a, human being, you know, going around the planet and whatnot, sometimes you hear people speak and, and they'll, they'll sort of mix up uh, words or sounds. And I often think 
to myself, I think we can probably think of a couple of famous people that do that. Um, I always think to myself, perhaps they have a learning difference because they're not pronouncing things the same way that everybody else does. But a lot of these people are really successful in life, but we also want people to grow into adulthood and feel um, important. So one of the things we spoke about the other day that I want to get into a little bit is, you know, entrepreneurial mindset. And just, you know, for our listening audience, you know, the way we define entrepreneurial mindset is more of a growth mindset and, and looking at opportunities um, in front of you and trying to turn challenge into opportunity. And sometimes people need an advocate like yourself to help guide them so that they can feel like they have a voice in a complicated school system that they might not understand, or that it's not only, you know, they're right, but maybe the responsibility to be the squeaky wheel, which as parents, you know, sometimes we have to play that role just to make sure that people are, are cared for. So we began the conversation, you were talking about your experience as a teacher, and I know you've lived in different states, um, and how that evolved into you creating a business around what your passion is and what your need is. So I want you to share with us a little bit about, um, you know, your model, uh, how how do you uh, work with parents, how do they find you, and, and how do you continue to uh, support them in, in, in the work that you do. Absolutely. So, you know, I think I've always had an entrepreneurial mindset and that's probably my own neurodivergence. Um, I can remember always trying to sell the most Girl Scout cookies as a <laughs> child. And so, you know, I really found this niche and um, everything's grown organically by word of mouth. I've been very fortunate. Um, you know, I know COVID, really impacted education. And so that's where then a lot of families sought me out to help them. And that is hard to tease out. Is this a disability or is this, you know, not having education during the time of shutdowns and, you know, or not being able to access virtual learning and so forth. So that was really a turning point. Um, and so my model is that of, you know, working with um, families at this point now hire me. I'd like to evolve that in the future. So I'm continuing my training um, with the Master IEP Coach Network and looking into um, trying to form more partnerships with nonprofits and local agencies um, so that they can hire me to put on trainings for families. And I also want to include teachers in that conversation. I think you know, a big issue that I run into a lot is, you know, parents have this belief that the school is against them. And then schools have this belief that parents are asking too much or they don't understand the system and they're just clueless, you know, so I really want to bring the two sides together and have that collaborative team approach, because at the end of the day, we just want to help the child. And so if I can kind of flip upside down some of those, um, mindsets that, you know, a child isn't trying hard enough to read, or, you know, if they would just pay attention and be focused, they would do better. And so, you know, it's yeah, not I think child's that, fault. Yeah, I think I, I love the, the model that you have, or the vision, I should say that you have um, for, for kind of scaling your business, if you will, because I think that idea of, you mentioned the master IEP, you know, training, is really getting a, a more um, people like yourself, they could be teachers, they could come from other professions as well, but uh, they could be parents who've spent you know, decades working through this process with other people, um, but really uh, the ability to um, impact um, change. And I think a, a positive way, because what I hear from you is, is, and you said this the other day, is that you're a very kind person, you're very persistent, but you're not, you know, an angry person who's going to rail against the system. Now, certainly some systems need that, right? They need the fiery um, uh, people. But I think in terms of looking uh, for opportunity and for change, uh, it, it sounds like you've got a great model um, in play. And so um, this has been such a great conversation, Alex, and I thank you so much for your work. And I would just like to ask you to share with everyone if they wanted to um, either connect with you or learn more about this kind of work, um, where would they go? How would they do that? Yes, yeah, so my website is alexjbergman.com. 
And then probably the most active um, social media platform that I'm on is Facebook. And I have a um, business page that's Alex J. Bergman, IEP coach. So. Okay, awesome. And we'll put that in the write-up, but um, but just keep in mind, everyone, you know, one out of four adults um, has some type of disability and not all of them have had the opportunity to have a, a coach or a caring person like Alex, um, you know, guiding their parents through the process. So it's a, a good way for us to just, you know, lean into our empathy, but also um, into our life's purpose. So I thank you, Alex, for sharing that with everyone today. And I um, wish everybody a good day. Thank you so much.